online. 0161 228 is the telephone number if there's something you want to say. You pick the subject, by all means. I'll just chat until you do. I'm not bothered. And uh, I'm not bothered about the subject, that is. Talk about anything, you know me. Try not to have, uh, try not to have forethought. Uh, actually, I try to avoid all thought, but you can't. Well, think about it. Exactly. You can't, can you? You, you want to avoid thought. If you want to go through life without thinking, it's very, very difficult. Because you must start with that thought. You have to actually say, I'm not going to think today. I'm not going to... I do my best. I try my level best to not actually think about anything, but... Yeah, I don't know. It just, just sort of sneaks up on you when you're not looking. And the... I don't know. And the email address, Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk and the text number 07786 206 951 have you ever had your car pinched? no well I had mine taken oh blimey how long ago must be 30 years ago that was the last time I had my car pinched mind you I said a few months ago that I've never been burgled and I was on holiday so I, I perhaps ought to keep my trap shut on later. but anyway I, I've not had my car pinched for 30 years and then it was found in the next street and I, I don't know whether they just pinched it. It was, it was an old Morris 1100. You, you remember the 1100s? It was one of them. And I, whether they got round the corner and thought, dear God, I don't know why we pinched this, and swapped it for another, I don't know. But the cops never found it. I found it on my way to the paper shop. It, it, it even got to the stage where I started to think, I wonder if I parked it there and I've forgotten. <laughs> but... But I, I was convinced I hadn't. Anyway, so that was pinched. But frankly, when, when you report a stolen car to the cops, it's not a case of all hell lets loose, is it? They just say, right, OK, and they take all the details, and that's that. I'm not sure what else they could do, to be honest, but, but that's it. And what they're more concerned about is giving you the crime number, as usual. I, I mention it because of this woman, this doctor, who stopped to help somebody left the keys in a car, and we can't criticise her for that. She dashed off to deal with uh, an incident. Uh, consider the alternative is the American system, whereby the doctor would say, sorry, I'm not risking a medical negligence claim, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But you, you're left in the position, aren't you? You're thinking, well, okay, she dashes off there. And then, and then, the, the coppers say, oh, well, we're really determined to catch this person because it's very, very cruel. Well, yeah, it is, but is it any more cruel than any other individual having their car pinched? Probably not. It just seems it, doesn't it? Oh, here we go. Am I in the doghouse here? Talking about responding or, or getting involved in crimes, intervening when you see a crime being committed. Alan, yesterday you once again repeated your attitude to circumstances which might justify or not intervention to prevent a crime. You exampled the banks which, according to you, generate such immense profits they can clearly afford to carry any loss through crime. Ergo, why bother intervening? Why should the wealth or otherwise of a victim of crime affect any decision whether or not to intervene to prevent it? I'm not talking about intervening in armed or similar situations, but if, for example, a person is being robbed in the street, why should their ability to absorb the monetary loss in any effect, the, uh, the loss in any, have any effect, the moral decision to act? If a car's being vandalised and it's a Rolls Royce, should we shrug our shoulder, shoulders and pass by thinking, well, they can probably afford the repair? You were yourself the victim of a crime recently, and I'm sure you can easily stand the loss. Compared to many, you are rich. If only that were true. Should this, however, be the principle by which I would, if I have to, decided not to intervene to have prevented it? I think it was the actor Michael Caine who, when comparing the attitude to success and wealth in the US, said, um, in the UK and the US said, if I park my Rolls Royce in London, there's a good chance it'll be scratched or damaged when I return to it. In America, people would pass by and say, one day I'll be able to afford one of those. Well, all right, everything you say, everything you say is true. But... And there's always a but, isn't there? You have to make judgments in life, and they're not always pretty. And if intervening in crime means that you merely shout, Oi, stop doing that, or I'll call the cops, then we should all do it, I suppose. But the great, the great dilemma arises 
when it puts your life at risk? Now, would I put my life at risk? Well, I think the answer is probably no. But would I put my, in all circumstances, but would I put my life at risk to save an old lady who was being battered in the street, whether she was rich or poor? I hope the answer to that is yes. I suspect it's not, because inside, like everybody else, I'm a coward. But I might. But should I intervene to save the paper money of a bank and put my life at risk? I think the victims are different. They're different. The victims in the bank are commercial shareholders. And in a very, very, very long piece of string, you or I as bank customers. Obviously, bank crime must affect our charges at the bank. Of course it does. So, yes, there is, there is a distant human victim. But it's very, very distant. And, frankly... It's a balance of, do I put my life at risk to save someone from pain, or do I put my life at risk to save 55 million bank customers from paying not point not 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 one penny more interest? That's the equation, but you're absolutely correct. It is still theft, it is still crime, it is still what society requires. But that's the point I was making, and I hope you follow it. What do you say? Should we always intervene in crime? Is there a level where you make the decision? Not, we've got onto this from yesterday. We're not talking about it on the back of this police, uh, this doctor. She didn't get involved in dealing with criminals. She got involved in doing her duty to mankind as a doctor and helping somebody who was in difficulty, which is fine. And uh, would we have it any other way? I would hope not, though in America they do have to live with that, don't they? Tony in Rochdale. Hi, Tony. Hi, how are you? I'm not bad. What can we do for you? I, d I just think it's diabolical. That uh, sum of money that that young kid got for the injury he sustained playing for Manchester United Reserves. Over £4 million for the kid. I know Ferguson went to court and stuck up for him, and the players went and stuck up for him, and... Uh, would he be? A, would he have been a first ta first team player? Well, of course they're going to say yes. But the award that he's received is absolutely scandalous. It's not as though the injury has put him in a wheelchair. The kid can still do whatever he wants to do. He's got a job, and thank God he's healthy. But to give him four million pounds, I think is disgraceful. But. I mean, let me let me try a different tack, and I'm, I'm not exactly disagreeing with you. If somebody had stolen from them four million pound, yeah. would you expect, providing they were insured, would you expect the insurance company to give them four million pounds to replace the four million they had stolen? No. You wouldn't? You'd have murders trying to get your money back. No, no, no. But I'm, I'm not asking you what, whether it would be difficult or whether the insurance companies would cough. I'm just asking you about the principle. Somebody comes along, steals £4 million. They make the... the... Alan, Alan, I, I hear what you say. Well, I don't know whether you did. I did, I did. But well, do, do you think the victim, in uh, the victim, should be compensated for their loss, whatever that loss might be? Well... Of course, but four million pound for a, a reserve team player that nobody knew. But of course, they'll drum up. Uh, they, being the United mob, will drum up saying he was this, he was that. I mean, get it in perspective. He's showing the. He, well, he's, everyone knows what football is. It's all about money. But it's it's just diabolical the amount that they've awarded him. When you look around and see what other people are getting... Well, yes, um, but, but, that, but, but other people aren't on the edge, and, and I don't know whether this lad was or not. Well, who but, knows that? Well, who knows that? Well, in the end, in the end, uh, a, a, a court has been convinced that he was. But you're right, none of us know. But if it had been, if it had been hit by a, a, a motorist in a car accident, yeah. that's how they would have calculated the award. What they calculate is, first of all, what does he need to to deal with his injury? Well, not a right lot here, because he bust a few legs and they're fine that's now, up. by all accounts. So that's yeah. that. And then they have to look at what 
he needs to compensate him for the pain and disturbance. Well, OK, yeah. again, that'll be in there somewhere. Then they look at what it's cost him. Daft yeah. little things like taxi fares to the hospital and the like, all of that. So that's that. But the biggest part of the award here, it's not yeah. always the biggest, but it is here, is what has it prevented him from doing? And, and in the case of that, what has it stopped him from earning? Now, well, let me, let me put it to you like this. Cool. And I hope your listeners are listening to this. If that kid had been playing for Oldham Athletic or Rochdale or Stockport, do you think they'd have given him four and a half million? No, I don't. I definitely exactly. don't. And exactly. the reason, And the reason I don't... Is because if he was playing for Oldham or Rochdale... He wouldn't have been on the wages. He wouldn't have been on the wages, so exactly. his, his loss would have been less. But the kid was only a reserve player. But We're not uh, talking about Ronaldo or one of the first team well, players. Well, we are, because all those players were one... Well. were previous. You see, what, what the court looks at is what was his potential likely earnings. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to be an apprentice all his yeah. life. That's what they've looked at, and, yeah. and they've been convinced, the court's been convinced, that he's missed out on a career that was worth £100,000 a week. Well, I just think he's that... Well, not I, lots and lots of people say it's ridiculous, the way these footballers... Well, I think, I, think well we all, I, think, I think we all agree that the way they pay Premiership footballers is absolutely crazy. I agree with you there, Tony. Good on you, mate. Have a good day. Tony in Rochdale says the £4.2 million paid to the footballer whose career was ended, that's the terminology we use, whose, whose football career was ended, a glittering future was predicted for him and he's been compensated for the loss of that glittering future to the tune of £4.2 million. Had he been an electrician his award would have been considerably less. First of all, as an electrician, he probably could have continued to, if you like, follow his career path as an electrician with damaged legs. It's not quite as demanding as being a footballer. But then the money he would earn as an electrician is considerably less. So surely, surely, we should compensate people for the future they've had taken from them. Yeah, I know you get into a bit of Doctor Who time travel there, don't you, when you start thinking about that. But what about Colin Stagg? What about him? Because he's just got an amazing, as it's described, or even in the sun, clever with headlines as always, staggering £706,000. All right, it's not £4.2 million. But even he says, even he says, it's like winning the lottery. Colin Stagg, who he, I hear you ask, he's the man who was charged with killing Rachel Nickell and was eventually, some years later, he was first charged in 1992, he was eventually some years later cleared because of DNA evidence. So he, for years, was pointed out by the newspapers and the police for a while as the killer. And he's still, in many people's eyes, the bloke what did it, because there's no smoke without fire, is there? All of that went on. And he's been compensated £706,000. What do you think of that? This is the North West's biggest sports station. BBC Radio Manchester. Football. City. Having been there to witness City's first game of the UEFA Cup in the far-flung Faroes. The new season starts in the Faroe Islands. And in Barnsley for the second leg. Vassell can make it two on the night. He goes around the goalkeeper wide position and he scores. We'll be with Eastlands tonight as Mark Hughes' team take on FC Mijeland of Denmark. Everybody knows exactly where we expect to go this season and everybody's working hard to that end. Our coverage starts at 7 with commentary from 7.45. We want to get through to the next round. We want to put this tight to bed. The all-new Manchester Sports, live to Night from 7. BBC Radio Manchester. And the day that the A-level results are published, a new star grade, A star grade, is to be introduced at A-level to help the universities identify the most able students. Some universities called for the move because of the ever-increasing number of students with A grades. Um, it's, it's, it, 
I, I don't know what you do. I mean, we'll get the A star grade, and then, of course, everybody will get A stars, or very nearly everybody. So what will we have then? We'll have to have the, I don't know, the A comet grade. No, that doesn't mean you'll end up with a job in Comet, although a lot of graduates do. You'll end up with the A Comet grade, and then when we've done the A Comet grade, we'll have the A Mars grade and the A... I'm looking forward to the A Uranus grade. That'll be a cracker. It's 20 past 12 on BBC Radio Manchester. News headlines, Faye Rusko. Police say they're determined to catch the person who stole a doctor's car as she knelt by a pensioner who'd been hit by a bus in Salford. A pub landlord in Tameside has barred his local MP because he backed the smoking ban in public places. And teenagers achieved record results in their A-levels again this year. The national pass rate soared to 97.2%. Manchester's weather cloudy with some showers, highs of 18 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Traffic on the M6 at the moment looking fairly slow around Junction 16 at Stoke-on-Trent. One lane's closed on the southbound side of the carriageway because of an accident involving an overturned vehicle on the northbound stretch. On the northbound, it's the middle and outside lanes that have been closed off between Junction 15 and Junction 16 where it meets up with the A500. Taking a quick peek now to cameras on the M56. If you're heading into Manchester, between Junction 8 all the way through towards the M60, you should have a nice clear and ahead and no major issues on the M66 or the M61. Public transport all running to schedule. Don't forget though, if you can update me, call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. Decongesting Manchester, one car at a time. 2020 traffic. A very good day to you. It's just gone 20 past 12. It's Thursday, so Tuesday and Thursday for the next week or so, we're having a look at the congestion charge. We're breaking it up into the, the ten communities of Greater Manchester, the ten local authorities of Greater Manchester. We've done, we're done various bits. We had a go at Salford. And the idea is to give you information, that's all, and the opportunity to have your say as always with BBC Radio Manchester. Today it's Bolton. Jonathan Alley is at the Middlebrook Retail Park. Jonathan? Good afternoon, yes. Hi, how's Actually, it gone? It's not been too bad. It's been quite interesting talking to people. Earlier I was on Bolton Market for three hours and now I've been at the Middlebrook for just over an hour. And it's interesting talking to different people who are giving their points of view in our congestion conversation. And what the, it seems to be split almost 60-40 between those who are opposed to it and those who are actually in favour of the linked congestion charge to th nearly £3 billion pounds worth of Im improvements to public transport. And in fact, there's actually a congestion charge uh poster board right in front of me. It's a huge one that Greater Manchester Passenger Transport Executive have put up to try and encourage people to take part in this consultation exercise. Of course, in Bolton, what people want to know is what are the plans for the town under this scheme? Manchester's congestion charge station is BBC Radio Manchester. So if you live in Bolton, here's how it's looking. Cash from the congestion charge will mean more frequent trains, able to carry more people at peak times. There'll be improvements to railway stations at Daisy Hill, Hollins Wood, Bromley Cross, Bolton Central, Lostock, West Horton and Black Rod. You'll also see more buses running earlier and later into the day. There'll also be what's described as a rapid bus service into Manchester that will use dedicated bus lanes for half of the route. And the existing bus station will move next to the trains at Trinity Street to create a new transport interchange. You'll also see some more CCTV, interactive transport signs and yellow school buses. But what you won't get in Bolton is the tram. There are no plans to extend the Metrolink to Bolton. Charge, charge or no charge. No charge. Tell us what you think. Manchester's congestion charge station is BBC Radio Manchester. Well, you get all that stuff, whether you want all that stuff at the price it'll come, is up to you. You've been talking to them, Jonathan, in, in first of all, in the, in the, was it the market, you say, what's that knocking in the background, just for the record? Uh, that is someone actually cleaning out the drains in the background on the uh, main car park. All right, right well, soil. that's all right, as, as long as we know, because it's beginning to annoy me. However, what have, what have they been saying to you when they've been talking to you? Well, when I spoke to people on the market, it was more of a 70-30 split, it's 70 against 
pounds thirty percent for the congestion charge. However, here on on the Middlebrook, it's that's changed round to, as I said, about the sixty forty. And here's what people said to me earlier. Well, we, we shall play that in a moment or two for you, but uh, people have been saying all sorts of things, such as this. I think the public transport would have to uh, come first, um, otherwise it will never happen, will it? So which way will you be voting in the referendum? Just purely selfishly, I'd probably vote against it, because I'm a driver, don't use public transport. Having said that, I may use it if it uh, does improve. I think it's very good. I'm, I, I agree with it. I've, I've read the brochure about it and everything, and uh, I, I, it seems OK to me. So which way would you vote in the referendum? I'd vote for it. For it. Why? Because the roads are getting so congested, you can't move. So if people can get... But that's the thing. Can they organise it so that we can get on transport from one place to another? I mean, where we are, there's only bus once every hour. And where they are, will they get a bus more frequently than that? And I suppose the question that many people have on their mind, well, we might until we've got the congestion charge and then it might all fall apart again because the future's the important thing, isn't it? Once the congestion charge is here, it's here for good. It well, it's here for at least 30 years and I think in, in our lifetime that basically means for good. And I think this is one of the things that people have said is that they, are, they like the idea of the congestion charge, the improvements to public transport, but they're not confident, A, that the public transport will be in place before the congestion charge is then introduced and B, whether the public transport will be good enough afterwards and you know, one of those people came from West Horton and they were saying there's only this one bus an hour, is that going to improve? Possibly, because of course what may happen in the future is that local bus services may be re-regulated which will have a knock-on effect, but in the short term what Bolton gets is more improvements to its rail infrastructure six of those uh, railway stations are improved, you get a new park and ride just over the road from here at Horwich Parkway so you can park up and jump on the train go straight into Manchester. But that's, but that's already a comparatively new park and ride isn't it? it? I mean I know I know there's not I don't think there's a dedicated car park to that station but they're not short of car parking at Middlebrook. Well there is actually a, a shortage of car parking at the station because of course the rest of Middlebrook is privately run and they have actually taken action against Ah right so, they, so they, it needs it because of that and because of the popularity of that route, that rail line into Bolton from Preston. It's known as the Sardine Special. So what is part, what is part of these proposals will be, will be to have longer trains, which is why a number of these stations will have to have longer platforms to accommodate them. And this is one of the things that people say who are behind the what so-called Transport Innovation Fund is that they want these longer trains to come through, encourage people onto the railways and bring them off the roads. All right, well, the, the poster that you describe is encouraging people to vote because it's got to remain impartial. It doesn't say in which direction. Are there many people saying that they will vote or are there people saying, oh, they can go to hell, I'm not voting? No, from those people that I've actually spoken to, all of them seem to want to vote. There's a couple of in, you know, undecideds amongst them, mm. not quite sure how they will vote, but there's quite a number of people who have made up their mind already and will actually cast a vote in the referendum, which should take place in December, which has been organised by, uh, by the Passenger Transport Executive and by the Association of Greater Manchester Authorities. Jonathan, thank you very much. Jonathan Alley, you can still talk to him. He's there till about two o'clock, same as us. Jonathan Alley at the Bolton Middlebrook Retail Park. If you can't find him, then there's not much something wrong with your peepers, but if your peepers are a bit bad, follow the sound of metal banging on metal as the men mend the drains. And what do you think always? You can tell us by nipping in and seeing Jonathan or any of our other visits to the various parts of Greater Manchester with our congestion conversation vehicle, or, of course, you can get onto the website, which is Radio Manchester, dead easy, BBC... Well, you know where it is, but it's the usual thing, BBC Manchester slash... You'll get there. No problem. Or you can ring me, 0161 228 Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk. You can text 0786 206 951. Ernest in Charlton. Hi, Ernest. Good afternoon, uh, Alan. Good afternoon. I'm bloody glad you're back. Well, I'm quite glad I'm back in lots of ways. But <laughs> yeah. Could have done with the Art of the Olympics, but go on. <laughs> um, this statement you make every mo nearly every morning, Alan, about... Um, you can talk about anything you like. Yeah. I'm not bloody bothered. Yeah? Yeah. Well, do you remember the tsunami catastrophe? Well, it's hard to forget it. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, this 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 relates to a phone call I made, not uh, not uh, really uh, the the uh, tsunami. Um, I phoned up uh, regarding the tsunami catastrophe five days on the trot, and never got on. I thought, well, that's strange. Five days on the trot, so I left it till the Monday. And on the Monday, uh, I phoned up again. You you were discussing with somebody about people driving who. Uh, either don't indicate when they're turning left or right or indicate as they're turning. Mm. And I, I phoned up on that pretext and agreed with you, you know, agreed with your, with your listener and all this kind of thing. And I said, can I talk about something else? And like you always say, yes, you know. So I mentioned the tsunami. I still hadn't mentioned the country that does its nuclear test there under the atoll. Um... And the explanation you gave me, I can't remember. I wasn't very happy with your explanation, but nevertheless, I put the phone down. And then you... When you said my explanation, I'm not altogether sure what you mean by my explanation of what. Well, you gave, you gave your opinion of, of, uh, of why it happened and... Uh, and that really there's nothing to do with nuclear testing. Oh, I see. So I, 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 OK. Um, yeah. I understand what you mean. It wasn't the explanation of... Oh, no, no, no. Right. Uh, right. There's a fault there, apparently. Well, so we had a conversation about what caused or even contributed to the tsunami. Yeah. OK. And I mentioned to you that there was a country, France, in actual fact, now it's all over, that does its nuclear test under the atoll. Uh and you gave an explanation, your, your opinion kind of thing, and I wasn't very happy with it, but I, I, the fact that I'd got on eventually was was, uh, was contented with that, and I put the phone down. Your producer rang me back, which I, I, f I find unusual, I, I don't think that, re that, that very rarely happens, and she was absolutely furious. <laughs> really? She was, you know, I'm not joking, she was really, I was so taken aback, I didn't know what to say. She said, um, I blocked, she actually admitted, I blocked you. We don't have a block. Well, you know what I mean, she, she'd uh, refused to let me get through to you to discuss the, the subject. Yeah. And she said, I've done that five days on the trot. Well, well, well I can, I can... <laughs> There's nothing I can say to that. No, other certainly than... not. I mean, if you didn't know I was calling, how, how would you know? If it yeah, was... Indeed so. As, yeah, far as, as far as I'm concerned, obviously, if somebody rings today, it, it, such as you, rings yeah. today with a discussion about... Well, it doesn't matter, really, does it? About no, no. Football is £4.2 million. Pounds. Yeah. I will deal with any call that comes in on that subject at uh, all at any time. Of course. If, if that same person, you I'm saying here, if you rang tomorrow with exactly the same point of view, with exactly the same subject matter, and then on Monday and then on Tuesday, we, we just might eventually say, look, you know, this, is, this has done its death, it's gone, worked to death with you. I don't know whether we want to carry on talking to you about the same thing every day. No, this was... We do that. Well, I, I can't... I, I mean, it was, Alan, a, it was a long time ago. Yeah, how would you know if, if, if your producer wouldn't let me through? How would you know I, that? I have no way of knowing of that. Of course I know. That's why... So the thing is... What that's I'm why the producer and I have to have a good working relationship. Yeah, well, I forget her name. But, well, uh, well, I wouldn't want you to tell me anyway. No, oh, right. But, but, but you... You, I mean, you know, she was bloody furious. <laughs> that got on. Well, I, I, you I've have got no right to do it. That I way, have nothing know. to say about that. I, I mean, this is—it's too late now to do anything about it. Of course, you know, Alan, but if you've been bugging me ever since, well, all right, but I, I had to get it off me off my head. Uh, well, welcome, <laughs> and, and I'm glad you did in a way. But as I say, Alan, but I'd have preferred that you told me earlier. By that, I mean either drop me a line, an email, or whatever, yeah, and yeah. told me because that—that's an allegate. I, I, I'm not saying you're not telling the truth. Yeah. But that's an allegation that I can't pursue now. It's too long oh, ago. Certainly. Alan, all I, all I needed to do was to get it off me, my, off me chest and tell you what actually all happened. All right, well, I shall, I shall take that as it is, a statement and of fact as you see it. Yeah, there's, an, there's another thing, Alan, I'd like, I'd like to mention. All right. Do with nuclear tests. Right, you know, we seem to be ricketing about, but go on. Car <laughs> cars get blamed, fridges, God knows what for climate change mm. and all that, you know. Can you explain to me why every country that, had, that did nuclear tests that were, uh, you know, uh, that, that could do them, that had the uh, yeah, I know what you facility, mean. All the nuclear countries were yeah. all above ground, right? We did ours in Australia, I believe. We did. Uh, yeah. I think the Yanks did theirs in the Nevada desert, mm -hmm. so forth, so forth. Then all of a sudden, 
They all went underground. Correct. With the fr- with the French going under the water under under, under mm. the atoll. Yeah. Now, don't you think that's a coincidence? Did, did, don't you think they knew what the, what they'd done to, to climate change and to the atmosphere and to the you know, and to, to the uh, globe in general? And thought, oh bloody hell, look what we're doing. we we you know, and they went underground, all of them. So you know, um, and yet they well, blame the cars and God knows what. All right, well, I'm, I'm right. I don't know whether anybody decided that they would move their nuclear tests underground because of climate change in the sense we understand it today. But don't you think it's a coincidence, Alan? Well, no, and I was about to explain why... I'm working from memory here. It was a long time ago. Yeah. But if I remember, one of the things they were concerned about was the... The, the, we used to call it fallout, which is a, yeah, yeah. An, an unfortunate term, but that's what it, it was called, yeah, yeah. which was a, a pollution that was being released into the atmosphere, yeah. and that pollution was not just dissipating in the atmosphere, but was actually sitting in the atmosphere, being transferred with the weather and eventually getting rained back down onto Earth somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And they then decided individually, unilaterally, or what have you, to have the tests below ground so that there would be no escape. But what damage have they done in the meantime, Alan? That's what I'd like to know. Well, I don't know in terms of climate change or elsewhere. Of course not, no. We do know, if you remember the terrible event in Russia, Mm -hmm. do you remember that? When a a, a power station, a nuclear power station, burned Uh, out. Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Yeah. And for many, many years afterwards, you couldn't you couldn't sell your milk as a farmer exactly. in yeah. Wales because of that kind of fallout. But yeah. we're talking about entirely different amounts here. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not for one second suggesting that nuclear fallout or the, the consequences of nuclear testing were zero by any means. They mm-hmm. weren't. But they realised there was some... What they were prepared to admit they were, I don't know, but they realised where there was some and decided henceforth to do the testing underground. Mm-hmm. Now, you're right, and we don't... I, I don't know. I'm not altogether sh- that trustful of scientists that they know mm-hmm. what damage was done by nuclear tests, but certainly some must have been done. Of course. Now, whether, to go back to your original point, whether the underground tests made a measurable, should I say, a measurable contribution to the tsunami, I don't know. I've, I've no idea. I'm not oh, a, I'm not a geologist. Idea. But yeah. but it's, there's, there's some logic in the question. Mm. That's all you can say of it, isn't it? Of course, yeah. And, and yeah. if you do, and we're learning this, aren't we, massively, we're learning that the more we beggar about with Earth, the, the more we learn that we know nothing. That's true. We are reminded frequently that we know nothing. I mean, you had... You had Prince Charles reported yesterday saying that the introduction of genetically modified crops could lead to the worst, the worst, would you believe, environmental disaster ever. Well, I, I wouldn't take uh, credence. I wouldn't give credence to anything he says. I don't think he's a full shill in any way. <laughs> <laughs> Each to their own in their judgments. But, but the point I'm making is that there are all yeah. sorts of people making predictions. I frankly lost faith in scientists generally. I yeah. mean, there are some you, you sort of respect and trust and all the rest of it. But I lost faith in scientists generally, particularly climate scientists, when they told us that we were facing a, a miserable life of an ice age was coming towards us and That's a decade right. later we were getting too hot <laughs> yeah, and i thought yeah. well if i just sit still it'll go cold again according <laughs> to them so if I, if I do absolutely nothing other than what i've already been doing all my life it'll make no difference at all because they haven't a clue exactly but yeah, then you're yeah. predicting the future how could they have a clue anyway I, the nearest you'll get to an apology is i'm sorry you had that trouble Alan, all that time ago your, it was not it, your fault it, it is my fault i sit in this chair and the one sat in this chair ca- takes the rap That's no, but if the message isn't put through to well, you, Alan, how would you Well, if ever it happens again to you or anybody else, then drop me a line. I appreciate that there could be a difficulty in communication via the phone, but drop me a line. Yeah, OK, And uh, we will 
We will deal with it here. All thanks right. For, thanks for talking to me. My Alex. pleasure. It's why I exist. 0161 228 2255. Tim in Worsley, the interviews that Jonathan Alley is making on the proposed congestion charge are unlikely to be representative of each area. Many residents travel daily to Manchester and their views may well have been very different from those interviewed. Therefore, the proportions given for and against have little relevance. Well, Tim, you're absolutely correct, and we're not presenting those, well, at least I hope you're not, we're trying not to present those as representative of the people. All they are, all they are, is an example of what people have said to us. I very rarely on this programme say the people of Manchester believe this, the people of Gloucester believe this, the people of Czechoslovakia believe this. I don't know what the people of those places think. I only know what the people who talk to me think, and I only know what they tell me. If they actually think something else and lie to me, I have no idea. So you're right. It is not, by any, any means, a, a perfect cephalogical science. But the idea, as I understand it is to get people to get all of us because we're going to have to vote at some point and to get all of us to consider the issue the last thing we want I, I, we makes it sound like i'm speaking for the bbc i'm not the last thing i want from the referendum when it comes on the congestion charge the last thing i want is for nobody to come nobody if if people turn out and vote for or against frankly I'm not fussed either way, but the one thing I don't want is for people to not turn out and vote. I know it's a person's democratic right, but the last thing we need is for people to not vote. So the idea is to at least tell you what's going on in your area and to give you the opportunity to talk to somebody like the BBC who hasn't got an axe to grind, who says, look, this is what they're saying you'll get, this is what they're saying it'll cost. Make your mind up. That's all we're doing. Just gone 20 to 1 on BBC Radio Manchester. Faye Roscoe with the headlines. Despicable, that's how a police officer's described the person who stole a doctor's car in Salford as she tended to an injured man. Police are investigating death threats which have been made against a counsellor in Tameside. And detectives in Cheshire hunting a gang of four thieves who carried out a terrifying million-pound lorry hijack at a stage of roadside reconstruction today. Manchester's weather cloudy with some showers, highs of 18 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Well, if you're travelling on the M6, either north or southbound, watch out for the heavy delays around Junction 15, Stoke-on-Trent through 16 at Crewe. And the reason being because of an overturned vehicle on the northbound carriageway. The middle and outside lanes have been closed off since around about quarter past 11 northbound, and the outside lane on the southbound is also shut to traffic as well. That's causing traffic to queue back on the southbound to Junction 17 at Sandbach. In Alderley Edge, we're seeing delays on Wilmslow Road on the cameras around Riley. Lane. Uh, roadworks in the area slowing traffic right down. Uh, hopefully, though, we should see an improvement uh, around about half past three. That's when those roadworks are scheduled to finish today. Don't forget, if you can update us, call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm Carla Banks. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports. Live to Old Trafford first, where Lancashire started this morning on 204 for 8 in their first innings against Yorkshire. Chris Malaband, is the Red Rose still in bat? No, I'm afraid, Andy, they are not. No, Lancashire were bowled out for 231 in their first innings. They got to 231 for 8 with Croft and Keady building a partnership that was worth 66. But when Stephen Croft held out to Adil Rashid, thumping the ball straight down the throat of Rana Naveed at deep mid-off, Saj Mahmood quickly followed and it was 231 all out. Disappointing, really, for Lancashire, only picking up one of the five available batting points. Yorkshire then had to try and post a decent reply. They've had problems at the top of the order, just like Lancashire, all season. And yet again, they struggled to get a decent start and guess who picked up the wicket for Lancashire yes Dominic Cork in his opening over trapping Chris Taylor LBW for two current score Yorkshire nine for one in the eighth over well we can hear the thoughts of Stuart Law the Lancashire skipper he's been talking about the club's decision not to offer Dominic Cork a new deal if it was up to him he'd have kept the veteran on well I would have put forward that um, you know to get the quality that he shows um, where we're going to get that from um, in times of need when you know things aren't going our way you throw the ball to Dominic on the field he can make things happen um, you know it, it would have been it would have been easier 
you know, to, to go into a season with Corky in your side. You can hear full commentary of Lancashire's Red Rose match against Yorkshire online at bbc.co.uk slash Manchester. Cricket's 2020 Champions League has been put back to December. It's because it clashed with the Champions Trophy. Manchester City's efforts to sign a new striker have suffered a blow. The club have had an offer for Roque Santa Cruz rejected by Blackburn. Joanne Smith, Scott Moore. Blackburn received a bid late last night and immediately turned it down. They've again said the Peregrine International's not for sale and are disappointed with City's continued interest. But this offers good news for the club's fans. Some thought that Mark Hughes wouldn't have any money to spend this summer. Meanwhile, Micah Richards and Martin Petrov are both fit for tonight's UEFA Cup match against FC Michelin. They're from Denmark and could be a threat to Mark Hughes' side. It's going to be a difficult game. The are good opposition uh, playing well at the moment and uh, be a big test for us. It's certainly not a, a walk over which people might be in danger of thinking because uh, they're a big, strong, physical side and we'll have to ma match that. Hughes has also told us that Vedran Chorluka and Stephen Island are going nowhere. Chorluka almost signed for Spurs last weekend. City's European match is live tonight at 7 in Manchester Sports. The kickoff is at 7.45. City, meanwhile, have been drawn away against Brighton in the second round of the Carling Cup. Macclesfield will play West Ham at Upton Park, while Oldham go to Burnley. There are home ties for Wigan, who take on Notts County, and Bolton, who face Northampton. The president of FIFA, Set Blatter, has told the BBC that the Premier League wants to play some League Cup ties abroad after plans to stage the so-called 39th League game overseas were withdrawn following heavy criticism. But the Premier League say a number of options are being considered and wouldn't confirm they want to play cup matches in foreign countries. Salford have signed their third player in as many weeks. Back row forward Luke Swains joined from Australia. And at the Olympics, British light heavyweight Tony Jeffries is through to the last eight in the boxing, but Billy Joe Saunders is out, losing in the second round. John Thompson in a world of his own. It's funny when you meet a celebrity. I once met Roger Moore, you know. I went, hello, John Thompson. He went, oh, Roger Moore. And he came into Maple and he sat down in the chair and he said it was a proper bond quip that Maple was right. And what can we do for you, Roger? And he went, just fill in the cracks, darling. <laughs> John Thompson. Isn't it funny when you go to a B&B &B and you go, oh, shall we have a game of chess? And the pieces that have gone missing over the years, what people have crafted in a bishop, like an old <laughs> pen top. A 2P with a face drawn on it. What's that then? Well, that's a black bun. <laughs> How do you know? John Thompson's take on the world. Stick him in the stocks. Saturday from 11 on BBC Radio Manchester. Now, you know me, I'm not a bitter man, but I think John Thompson should burn in hell and the burning should start as soon as possible. Why is this, I hear you ask? Because we know, Alan, that you are not a bitter man. Well, I'll tell you why. He's been on the Gadget Show. He was on the Gadget Show on Channel 5. And I've never been on the Gadget Show. And I've never missed a Gadget Show. He's got no rights to be on there. I hate him and everything he stands for. And I'll tell him when I see... In fact, I might text him. Yes, assault him with a gadget. That'll learn him. Ha! Alan Bezik with you on the phones. 0161 228 2255. BBC Radio Manchester. John in Timperley. Hiya, John. Uh, yes, good morning, Alan. I was just a bit worried then for a moment in case you were John Thompson. Uh, no, <laughs> no. But I, I'm a, I am a bitter man as it happens. Oh, that's all right. Real ale only. Right, here oh. we go. Oh, very good. Uh, um, I'm worried because I know your thoughts on the Olympic Games, but don't worry, it's not really about the Olympic Games. Right. It's about this title, Team GB. Oh. Now... We were arguing the other night, and blow me if some something else in the paper this morning has rather muddied the waters. But what is the difference between the United Kingdom and Great Britain? I, we'll we'll push out of the way of the British Isles. I know what that is. But what's the difference between the United Kingdom and Great Britain? And the reason I say that the waters have been muddied this morning is that somebody from the Isle of Man is saying that they're not members of... Well, I can't remember which one it is now, United Kingdom or Great Britain. Or have you seen the letter in the paper this morning? Um, I don't usually read the letters page. Tell me what paper it was in. I think it's in the Times. 
you think? Well, it is in the Times, yeah, but I didn't like to advertise. <laughs> <laughs> well, saying I think it's in the Times. <laughs> uh, it's in the Times, and they, okay. they're saying uh, something about the Isle of Man isn't a member of... I think it's Great Britain, but I may be the wrong way around. Well, you, you, I think you're probably right. It, it, it is... I think the Isle of Man... I, I don't know is the answer to your question, and we'll have to rely on somebody else to come on and tell us. But I think the answer is the United Kingdom is what, if you'll take this expression, we might call the state. Yeah? So, yeah. so that's, 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 if you like, the administrative country. We are the United Kingdom. Yeah. However, the Isle of Man could well be part of Great Britain, because I'm not altogether sure that Great Britain has what you might describe as a, a specific definition. You're, you're right with the British Isles, that involves, Ireland. much to their chagrin, that, um, that involves the island of Ireland. Yeah. Um, but of course the United Kingdom only involves of the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland. Well, let me ask one... Is Please, I, I, I won't know the answer, but fire away, because somebody might. Well, is the situation of the Channel Islands similar to the Isle of Man, which, after all, has its they have their own government as well, don't they? They do. And what it all comes down to is that we were arguing, if, in fact, you're going to argue one way or the other, somebody that is a cyclist from the Isle of Man and somebody that's an archer from the Channel Islands, are they covered by the word Team GB? Um, yes, if they are competing as a member of the British team. Uh, the, I, I don't know whether the Isle of Man has its own team. If it does, it'll not be a... No, 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 it doesn't. No. So, so, they are, so it's a person from the Isle of Man, a cyclist, born and bred, raised in the Isle of Man, rides his bike in the Isle of Man, and yet and yet represents the English, the, the British team, then, then is a part of Team GB. And I sub you see, the, the problem is, when you start looking at the definition of states, mm. there are so many different ways of measuring it. For example, Great Britain in the Olympic Games is a negotiated position and only applies to the Olympic Games definition. The team is made up of people from these parts of this country or the, the, this part of the globe. Mm. And, I, think, and I think that's similar to the West Indies cricket team where the countries so. have absolutely nothing to do with each other at all apart from cricket. Absolutely so, in, indeed. Uh, 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 diametrically opposed to each other in various Hate ways. Hate each other in some cases. In some cases, <laughs> yes. So, again, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the Channel Islands and we see the Channel Islands as one entity and in some ways they are. But if you, if you notice, whenever they describe the Jersey police, they never say, like we say, Greater Manchester Police Authority or it like that. They say the states, plural, the states mm -hmm. of Jersey police. And, and just as a matter of, of information, if you turn to page three of that same newspaper, The Times, there is a photograph of a, of a, a, a police officer, and there he is with a, a states of Jersey police. So the, the states of the Channel Islands are possibly independent states. For example, we talk about the Channel Islands, and mm. yet Sark has its own oh, yeah. government of sorts. So I don't know the answer to your question, and I'm not sure mm. that the question can be answered without context, but certainly those who are cycling under the aegis of the Great Britain team, the British team, Team GB, are whether, whatever state they're from, whether they're from uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, the Channel Islands, wherever, that they are there as their own. Have you managed to get uh, to the letter page? I, I got to it and uh, it, moved on. It'll be it... a tiny little bottom right hand corner of the page, I know that, but I, can't, mm. I haven't got the paper. Well, it, well, as I say, the, the answer won't change whether I read the letter specifically or not, because it, there isn't there isn't an answer without without first of all quantifying what it is you want to answer about. I mean, your correspondent Chris Wood has not appreciated all all aspects of the nomenclature problem. Team UK would still not be all inclusive, as the team includes two cyclists from the Isle of Man, which is part of the British Isles, but not part of the UK, which is why they're saying you can't call it Team UK. But you but could you call, it call it Team GB. GB. Great Britain. Great Britain um, can be almost whatever you want it to be. Well, I must tell you now, I, I've always been bewildered by the uh, position of Wales. I do not understand, and I don't think anybody else understands, 
why A, they're not represented on the Union Jack, and B, why they've got this peculiar thing about a principality. I honestly don't understand it. Um, if you go on to the website, or go on to the internet and look up the United Kingdom and flags and the like, there is an explanation on there, and I've forgotten it, but there is an explanation. Wales was actually incorporated into what we now call the United Kingdom, but in those days would probably have been called England, was incorporated into it and given a prince, the Prince of Wales. It's a principality, it has its own place. Um, but it is part of the UK. And Mike has just sent me this, which may help both of us. The UK is Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The Isle of Man is a member of the British Isles, and in the Commonwealth Games competes on its own. Correct, yeah. So in the Commonwealth Games, it's the Isle of Man, part of the Commonwealth, which I'm not altogether sure it formally is. In Great Britain... That is the UK and Northern Ireland, but we've already established that the Isle of Man is neither the UK nor Northern exactly. Ireland. So, so, Mike, it was a good stab, but I think, I think we're less informed now than when we uh, began. Well, I, I think we're both slightly wrong, uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure we've got the definitive answer. Um, right, well, it, well, I'm told that Stuart may be able to help us in Newell Green. Stuart? Hi, Alan. Go on. The Isle of Man and Jersey and the other Channel Isles are autonomous protectorates of Britain. Autonomous protectorates? Yes. Yeah. But does that mean they form part... I, I appreciate they're autonomous and protectorates, but... Well, they does, all have their own government. Well, I'm aware of that, but does that mean that they are part of it, or does that mean that they are not part well, of the UK? They're not part of the UK in terms of international law, well, indeed, they're not members of the EU. I don't know about the Isle of Man, but Jersey and so on and so forth mm. are members of the no. EU. So... And I had a wonderful holiday with my parents in 1962, and some of the locals took great pride in telling us that we actually belong to Jersey because of the Norman Conquest. <laughs> <laughs> There's some technicalities that we actually do belong to well, Jersey. Well, I'm, I'm perfectly happy for them to take over. As, as <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Alan. <laughs> Go on. Having said that uh, Jersey and, and the, the Channel Islands are protectorates, we didn't, do a, we didn't do a good job during the war, did we? We didn't do a good job no. during the war no. of the Channel Islands. Indeed, a decision was made. Well, I, can I butt in and yeah, say, I think, in fact, I'm not quite sure that the Channel Islands produce any money towards the defence budget of, uh, of Great Britain. So they can't have it both ways. Well, they, they may not have done, but we didn't... It was still a protectorate. It was still governed by the king at the time. At the time. The crown. Oh, I think but, taxation... Uh, but no, no, no. On, we then. didn't do a good job. Hitler invaded the Channel Isles. Yes. And caused a lot of... Uh, killed a lot of people, actually. Mm. If you, I don't know if you've ever been, ever been to Jersey, but it, it was fortified to considerable extent. Yeah. I mean, Churchill made what we would call loosely uh, a diplomatic decision, didn't he? Yeah. He, had, he had to decide, do we, do we defend the Channel Islands and all that that would cost, or do we say, you've got to forfeit them like we forfeited France? Strategic withdrawal is the word. I think it might be. John, Stuart, to Hi, both John. of you, thank oh, you yeah. very thank much. Thank you very much indeed. Bye, you know. Have a good day. 161 228 Are we further forward? Well, that's hard to tell. Um, I can tell you what Tim says, for he has sent me an email which has been... Uh, Tim in Worsley, he sent me stuff from Wikipedia. Always wary. The United Kingdom is a union of four constituent countries. England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. The United Kingdom is governed by a parliamentary system with its seat of government in London, the capital, and is a constitutional monarchy with Queen Elizabeth II as the head of state. The Crown dependencies of the Channel Island and the Isle of Man, formerly possessions of the Crown, are not part of the UK, but form a federacy with it. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, commonly known as the UK, 
or Britain, is a sovereign island country located off the northwestern coast of continental Europe, just in case you can't find it. The UK includes the island of Great Britain, the northeast part of the island of Ireland, and many small islands. Northern Ireland is only part of the UK with a land border sharing it with the Republic of Ireland. Apart from this land border, the UK is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean, the North Sea, the English Channel and the Irish Sea, the largest island Great Britain is linked to France by the Channel Tunnel. I feel so informed, and yet simultaneously, I'm no further forward. I still haven't a clue. Team GB. It's a daft title. On the day the A-level results come out, Manchester City face their own Danish examination tonight. Commentary on their game against FC Michelin from seven. So you tell me, where does where does the United Kingdom stop and the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man begin? And where does Britain stop? 95.1 FM, DAB Digital Radio, and the World Wide Web. This is Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester. One o'clock, disgust as thieves steal a doctor's car as she treats a man who'd been knocked down in Salford. Whilst you think that you know the depths at which people will go, you occasionally get surprised and surprised in a bad way. And Tameside councillors receive death threats. Cruz is staying at Blackburn. Well, the good news about this day is it does get better as it goes on. We'll see some sunny spells this afternoon. Top temperature, 18 Celsius. And if you're travelling along the M6, watch out for some delays on the north and southbound sides of the carriageway between Junction 16, Stoke-on-Trent and Junction 17. Two lanes closed on the northbound side and one lane closed on the southbound. Good afternoon, I'm Faye Rusko. Police say they're determined to catch the person who stole a doctor's car as she knelt by a pensioner who'd been hit by a bus in Salford. A pedestrian believed to be in his 70s was hit on Eccles Old Road in Weest. The doctor, who happened to be passing, looked after the man, leaving her keys in her car ignition. Superintendent Ian Palmer said he'd be shattered if his car was stolen in those circumstances. What a disbelief. It would be something that would knock my trust in human nature to the very core and I think um, it's incumbent upon us as a police service and uh, the community in that area to respond and restore that lady's trust in human nature and do everything we possibly can to first of all return that vehicle to her and then assist bringing that offender to justice. Police are investigating death threats which have been made against a councillor in Tameside. John Taylor's details recently appeared on a violent far-right website redwatch.net and since then he's received numerous emails saying he'll be shot in the head. Councillor Taylor's known for his criticism of the British National Party. Greater Manchester Police say they're trying to trace those responsible. A pub landlord in Tameside has barred his local MP because he backs the smoking ban in public places. Roger Hantelick says Ashton and Line MP David Hayes isn't welcome in the Prince of Orange because the ban has had such an impact on his business and he's making sure everyone knows he's not happy. Postal outside the premises, barring David Hayes, the local MP, as he's backed the no smoking ban, which is leaving my business in turmoil. I've lost half the business and he's not welcome until the decision gets turned around. The government's promising to make A-levels even more challenging as more students than ever were awarded A-grades today. There was also an increase in the overall number of passes. The school's minister, Jim Knight, says standards aren't dropping, but he does want to make it easier to spot the very best students. We're introducing a new A-star grade to stretch those who are the very brightest. We're introducing a new extended project, which is worth half an A-level. So there's various reforms, but we're also giving universities the individual marks for the A-level modules if they want them so that they in turn can differentiate between the quarter or so of the 40% who take A-levels who get an A-grade. Russian tanks are still operating along Georgia's border with South Ossetia. Two days after a ceasefire was declared, there have been explosions around the Georgian town of Gori, which has been under Russian control for several days. The United States has called on Moscow to withdraw all of its troops from the country. Police investigating prostitution 
Extortion and corruption have arrested 14 people, among them a woman officer from the Northumbria force. The arrest took place during raids in Greater Manchester, Lothian and Borders and Durham. And the former Big Brother contestant, Jade Goody, is to take part in India's version of the series called Big Boss. She'll enter the house alongside a dozen Indian celebrities. The programme's hosted by Shilpa Shetty, the Bollywood star who won public sympathy after su suffering alleged racist bullying at the hands of Miss Goody in the Channel 4 series last year. BBC Radio Manchester Sports with Andy May. Roque Santa Cruz won't be joining Manchester City. Blackburn have rejected a bid worth up to £10 million for their striker, again insisting he's not for sale. Rovers are disappointed that Mark Hughes even made an offer for his former player. One striker on the move today, though, is Marlon King. Wigan have let him join Hull on a season-long loan. The Premier League are hoping to play some League Cup ties abroad, according to FIFA president Sepp Blatter. And it's Yorkshire batting against Lancashire now in the county championship. Chris Malabans at Old Trafford with the latest on day three. Yorkshire are 29 for one in the 13th over with Andrew Gale on 14 and captain Anthony McGrath on 11. This in reply to Lancashire's 231 all out. Stephen Croft making 68. The last two Lancashire wickets going down with the score on 2-3-1 after Croft and Keady had built a decent partnership for the ninth wicket. Dominic Cork with the wicket for Lancashire trapping Chris Taylor LBW for two. 29 for one Yorkshire in the 13th. There's ball by ball commentary at bbc.co.uk slash Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester, satellite weather with Heather Stott. Well, we're on the up weather-wise a little bit earlier than we anticipated. There's quite a bit of blue sky out there. I think through the morning it's patchy cloud, it's sunny spells, but I think through the afternoon everything really starts to settle down and most places have a dry and a fine one. It isn't terribly warm, though. I think the best temperature you can expect is 18 Celsius. Alan Bezik with you on the phones. 0161 228 2255. I mentioned in passing the gadget show a few moments ago. Needless to say, somebody uses it to hit me with. Keith in Blackpool. Hi, Alan. You fancy that Susie Perry, don't you? You're not alone. She's out shopping. She won't hear this. Listen, I don't fancy Susie Perry. She scares me. Terrifies me. Uh, it, just for the record, I don't fancy the other three either. In fact, I think the, the new one with the air is a bit of a Jesse, but he does get some good gigs, doesn't he? Anyway, 0161 228 2255. You've no idea what we're talking about. It's on Channel 5. There's only 12 people watch it, and they're all nerds apart from me. 0161 228 Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk and 07786 206 951 if you would like to text us. Joyce in Warrington. Hiya, Joyce. <laughs> Hello, Alan. Uh, just a quick comment, which I think actually is on the, the British Isles. Uh, oh, yeah. but right. I think my previous, your previous call actually is, it has in fact covered what I was going to say, but I'll say it anyway. The term Great Britain is in fact a geographical term, goes going back to Roman times when the British Isles, uh, all of the British Isles, Great Britain is the greater of the two islands as opposed to the lesser one, which is Ireland. And your previous call is quite right. The UK is, in fact, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Great Britain being, of, you know, England, Scotland, mm. Wales. I'm not quite sure where it, where it puts Anglesey and Lindisfarne and the Isle of Wight, to be honest. But uh, that's the origin of the term Great Britain. And the UK, of course, as you rightly said, is the, the name of the state. And it's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Mm. So, so Great Britain, if, 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 for my benefit, we could refer to the British Isles as Great Britain and Lesser Britain, couldn't we? Yes, Lesser Britain Great, being the, the island Britain. of Ireland, if you like. That's right, yes. So that, that's how yes. we get to it. Uh -huh. Oh, that's, that, that's... that's the origin of it. Yeah. Grand yeah. Britain, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, you it's not to, to do with that. being grand and and powerful and things like no. that. It's, it's a geographical expression. It's like it's middle wallop Roman and Roman times, really. Yeah, uh, upper like, wallop and lesser wallop and middle wallop. Absolutely. What's that? Lower the, lower peaver. Well, what we have in Warrington here is Walton Inferior and Walton Superior. <laughs> do we? <laughs> um, you want up, yeah. My Walton Inferior. My, my grandparents came from Warrington, and I think I can guess which part. I came from, <laughs> from Walton, and I think I can guess which part. <laughs> right. but, but that's, the, that's the original origin of it, and, and uh, one of your other callers uh, rightly 
uh, said, like the Isle of Man and um, Jersey, Channel Islands, they, they're quite separate altogether, really. They don't come into the GB uh, UK equation. I, I think the term T, T and GB is just a, a compromise, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it is. It, it's yeah. a way of... It's, it's it's a, no you couldn't say official. Team GB plus a little <laughs> bit of island and, yeah. and some that's tiddly right. little islands yeah. that lurk about. You know, yeah, you couldn't do that, could you? It just gets no. complicated. No. But what do you think of the expression? It's very American for my tastes. Yeah, Team too. GB, I don't like me that. Too. No. no. But there you are. That's it's how it's all going. Makes yeah. it easy for the broadcasters. <laughs> <laughs> now, thank you very much for that. Uh, a fine dissertation on the geographic nature of these fair islands in the plural. I'm getting in no bother there. Bill in Macclesfield. Hiya, Bill. Good afternoon, all right. All right, love. I'm all right, yeah. Just um, that, ba that lady that we've just been on is basically correct. Um, Marvellous. But uh, I often think that the um, they copied the design of the, uh, the Empire, the British Empire, on the design of the, <laughs> these islands, to be honest, because it's a right hodgepodge. But let's get one thing straight. If you're a Manx man or um, a Channel Islander, you are a British citizen or subject, whichever way you want to look upon it. Um, and you are, you are, that's what you are. You are British you, in, in, uh, in legal terms. You have a British passport. Um, but, but, but hang on a minute. Let, yep. me, let me just try that. I mean, let's deal with the Isle of Man first, mm. because I've some knowledge of that, but not mm. much. Mm, I've been once. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, been a few, I've been a few more times than that, but not many. Um, but, but you say that one is British mm. if one is from the Channel Islands, but isn't that only because the Channel Islands have chosen to accept the international yoke of Britishness, if you like, by devolving their um, foreign affairs to the UK. But they reserve the right. They could at any point say, no, you're, you're not British. You, you don't pay tax to Britain. You don't have anything to do with Britain other than what we agree you will have to do. Well, again, this again is where the, um, the, the English masters have always been very, very, very clever politi politically. Mm. And they have designed in the Constitution, um, which I'm not an expert on, but there is part of the Constitution which gives the final say to, in effect, Britain, British Parliament. So they're not independent in the final result. They are they are under the yoke at the fire. It, well, it push came to show well, uh, without well, without resorting to military means. But, but that's right. Um, that's what, they are they are under British control. But they're not, are they? They're not. The, well, they are. The, well, because it's part. The, the final say would become part. It's something to do with the. Well, British, they, British I, th I think you're you're probably saying that they could be, and in the event of duress, they would be. We would just <laughs> absorb them, but constitutionally. They stand alone. They, they set their own rates of income tax, their own spending. They don't draw from the UK exchequer. They, they actually make a payment to the UK exchequer. It's not a lot, but that's, if you like, payment for the UK dealing with their foreign affairs. But they, they are a freestanding, they're not a nation, but they are a freestanding entity, self-governing entity. They are. They are. They, they, they're not allowed to have a navy or an army. Um, but as well, say, when you say they're I, not I, allowed I, to, do you mean they're not allowed to, or, or do you mean that they, they but, couldn't afford to and choose not to? Well, as I said, I'm not a, I'm not mm. an international lawyer, but, but, that, I, I do, I, but, but I that, do... But that's I, where I, we get in a mess, but, isn't but it? I do re, I, but I do have the knowledge, I do have the knowledge that in the final resort, it's due to some something to do with the Privy Council, the final say in all matters would be part would be down to whatever you call the Privy Council. But, but that Isn't applies... That something to okay. the Lords? Well, the, 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 the Privy Council is actually a body separate of politics, mm. although nothing is, but you know what I mean. Mm. The Privy Council is a body separate of politics that it is there, effectively, to inform, advise and, uh, if you like, discourse with Her Majesty, the Head of State. Mm. And, in fact, you, do you remember the, the Pitcairn Islands a little while ago had a bit of bother? Mm. And the Pitcairn Islands were governed entirely independently. They were run in their own way. They did what they wished. Mm. But they were subject to Privy Council 
law, if you like, or to the, the rulings of the Privy Council. And if I remember correctly, a, a judge had to be dispatched to those islands on the part of the Privy Council mm. in order to hear mm. and try the cases that went on there, that, that were there, and, and, and to deal with those. But that wasn't the UK. That was the strange thing that the UK is a, a parliamentary democracy, if you like, uh, sorry, a parliamentary uh, monarchy, but Her Majesty, whilst, yes, she is the head of state of the UK, she's also the head of state, I suspect, of uh, Manx, she's also the head of state of Australia, that's for sure, and many of the other islands um, okay. in that vicinity. So, so while she is the head of state, that doesn't mean that our government has the power to rule there. Well, let's put it, let me just, just give you a very recent example. And by the way, the, oh, please do. By, by the way, the, like I say, the Australians are not British citizens. No. Or, or, or subjects. Um, well, they, well, they, 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 they may be, they may be um, a technically a British subject, because as you said, the Queen is a titter so ahead, of this, ahead of it. But, but unlike, unlike them, Manxmen and Channel Islands have a British passport. They hold British. Passport. Yes, they, they do. They are British. No, no. Just the same <laughs> well, it, as a Welshman again, is British, whether that, he likes it or not. A Scotsman's British. Again, yes, um, you are correct in that and, they, and hold, is too. They, they hold a British passport. Mm. But that doesn't render them British. That renders them... They are subject to the rule of law in the island of the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man in its rule of law has decided, or in its application of law, has decided that rather than run its own international current affairs, international affairs, it will devolve all of those to Britain. So it is, it's, it's rather like, and I don't want to raise this one, but it's rather like we are all members of the European community. I no longer have a British passport, I have a European passport. But that doesn't stop me being British and independent of all those other European countries. And I I think it's a good analogy because an, a, a, a Manxman now will no longer have a British passport, he will have a European passport despite the fact that they're not a member of the European Union. Mm. But they'll have a European one because there's no British passport anymore. But that doesn't make them, it doesn't make them French and it doesn't make them British either. Well, this again, this is, like I said, this is where <laughs> the English were very clever when they devised all these things. I mean, virtually every state in the empire had a slightly different concoction of form of government. <laughs> it became a very complicated thing. But like I say, I do, re I do know, because I did, I did hear a programme on it on the Radio 4 one evening about, about something about the Channel Islands, um, um, I was saying that in the final resort, um, Britain, British, whatever, whatever the title you give them, whether they call them uh, British or Manxman or Ulster, whatever name, at the end of the day, they are directly under British. If Bush came to show, there is a little bit of enough, enough in legal terms to leave the final say to, what do you call it, the... The British government or the, the the House of Lords, I do not know, but I do re do know that quite recently, the the Isle of Man did have to cow chow to um, e European um, legislation, and they didn't wish to do so. But Britain was pretty well asked to tell them to do as they told regarding the um, the cane. That is correct. Because the cane was what um, well, the pro made it a little bit of a special place in a way. Well, didn't it? again, the, the prop the prob I know what you mean. Yeah. Again, the problem was that Britain signed the this this is nothing to do with the European Union as such, but it signed the Europe the, the Bill of Rights, the European Court of Human Rights rules, and it signed to undertake that. The Isle of Man for a while said, Well we didn't sign it, we're not taking it. That that of course outlaws um corporal punishment. The Isle of Man said we're not doing it. We're not doing it because, frankly, we're not a member of the European Union, we're having nothing to do with it. And that's fine. They were entitled to that position. Yeah. Now, eventually, Britain was told that, or the UK was told, look, you are representing this island, called the Isle of Man, in current affairs. And if you want to remain part of this treaty, 
you have to obey the treaty in all the places for which you have responsibility. And internationally, they have the Isle of Man could have said to Britain, well, no, we're not going your way. We're sticking with the cane, the birch, and frankly, you can go to hell and we will stand on our own. But Britain would then have been forced, because of the rules of the treaty, would have been forced to say, then in that case, we can't represent you internationally. Oh. And, in that, and in that circumstance, the Isle of Man decided it's better to give up the cane than it is to have to take on all our own foreign affairs. Or, alternatively, he would have had to say, listen, we're uh, institution, instituting the, um, this business which I was explaining to you regarding the um, this um, Privy Council business, and um, if they disobeyed, then force would have had to be used. Um, and, and that would have been the alternative. All right. Good uh, on you, Bill. And Great Britain, by the way, is England, Scotland, and Wales. The United Kingdom includes Northern Ireland. Yeah, we Northern Ireland. we got that one earlier. Uh, yeah, 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 Great yeah, Britain. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the it's the it's the description of the island, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's positive, yeah. It, yeah. it didn't help when I think it was Joyce that gave us the thorough explanation. It didn't help when she said, "I don't know what that means for Anglesey." <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let us not go there. It's too difficult. They, they, they'd probably be listed to this program or they've instituted an Alaman type of government there. Yeah, it sounds good to me. <laughs> They can have it, frankly. I'd cut the men out straight and shove the whole bloody thing over to Ireland. Have a good day, Bill. Take care. Cheers, mate. The full title of this country is, according to many, including Tim and Worsley, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. The UK is made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Great Britain, or just Britain, does not include Northern Ireland. The Channel Islands and the Isle of Man are not part of the UK. So now you know! Morning sound better with Eamon O'Neill and Diane Oxbury. Eamon and Diane. Have a nice birthday. I did, yeah, I had a lovely birthday evening. Went around to my friend Andy's and his wife Tracy. Have a nice meal. I did, had a very, very nice meal. Did Andy or Tracy cook it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is the question. We don't insult Tracy's cooking because she's an armed police officer. Right. <laughs> so she has access to guns. Right. But she has no place within a kitchen. Eamon and Diane and you. Well, I started off as a lawyer, did that for a good few years, and then uh, about 18 months ago decided to go into project management. What does that mean? I kind of looked at the difference services around me and does sort of improve things and, and make things better. The Station with Eamon and Diane for breakfast. It's like a scene from a wedding. Back tomorrow morning from 6 at BBC Radio Manchester. A yeah, very good day to you. 0161 228 2255. It's 20 past 1. We got the news headlines with Faye Roscoe. Despicable. That's how a police officer has described the person who stole a doctor's car in Salford as she tended to an injured man on the road. Detectives are investigating death threats which have been made against a councillor in Tameside. And Russian tanks are still operating along Georgia's border with Ossetia two days after a ceasefire was declared. The United States has called on Moscow to withdraw from the country. Manchester's weather cloudy with some showers. Highs of 18 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Well, the delays in Alderley Edge seem to have cleared now from Wilmslow Road. It was looking quite held up for a time around O'Reilly's Lane, but as I say, all seems fairly quiet again. A different picture, though, on the motorways, the M6 southbound creeping along on camera because of a collision that's happened on the northbound between Junction 15 and Junction 16 at Stoke-on-Trent. Two lanes are closed on the northbound and the outside lane are closed on the southbound. That's causing traffic to queue back towards Junction 17 at Sandbach. No major issues on public transport. So far, so good. Don't forget, though, if you can update me, call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. BBC Radio Manchester. With 2020 traffic through until midnight. Through until midnight. BBC Radio Manchester. You wouldn't think it'd be so hard to live here, would you? Nigel in Buxton. Hiya, Nigel. Hi, Alan. Uh, some advice I'm after, actually. Um, it's regarding my mother. She was taken into hospital uh, some three years ago for an operation for bowel cancer. She had the operation and some months later it was deemed a success. Um, all was well and good. Um, she just get, got on with her life. Anyway, in March of this year uh, she had a fall and as a result of that, they did some x-rays and what have you, and it was discovered that she'd got further cancerous tumours on her lungs and liver, and also her lymph glands. As 
things progressed, we found out that after her original operation, she should have had chemotherapy, which didn't happen. Um, she, basically, the cancer that she's now got is, in, is completely inoperable. Um, so she's on a um, death sentence, if you like. A um, few other things ha happened in between times. For example, she was discharged, readmitted to hospital. The, for three days, she didn't have any medication because they'd lo lost the list of medication she was supposed to have, including her diabetes medication and warfarin for thinning of the blood because she was at risk of a stroke because of, she got blood clots. Um, I wrote to the patient's advice and liaison service at the hospital uh, with my complaints and my worries about the standard of care that she should have had and ha hadn't received. And um, they told me I would receive a reply to their investigation within five weeks. Now, that was ten weeks ago. OK. Um I don't know what to do about the 10-week letter. I, you said you wanted some advice. You've told me a story, and a, a perfectly believable one, unfortunately, our modern NHS, but what advice do you want? Right, where can I go with it now? Uh, that, I'll feel that's like dependent I'm... on what you want. But basically, I want, want to find out what went wrong with my mother's treatment. OK. It's... I hesitate to say this. It's almost impossible to find out on your own. Now, yep. you've not named any hospitals, and I would prefer, indeed, I will insist that you do not. Oh, I've got Some, no intention of doing that. Okay. Some hospitals are better than others. A patient does have the right to see their medical records under yep. the um, freedom, not the freedom of information legislation, the data protection legislation. So you can ask to see the records, or your mum yeah. can, or somebody on your mum's behalf. Probably, when dealing with matters of allegations, which is what we're talking about here, allegations yeah. of professional negligence, medical negligence, in not allocating chemotherapy when uh, circumstances suggest that it should have been, for that, you really do need a specialist lawyer. Right. Now, lawyers are very good at getting money. Yeah. What they can't do... I'm sorry if this sounds stupid. What they can't you do is... The clock back. They can't put the clock back. All exactly. they can do is get money. Now, if what you want, if you seriously... Because everybody says that. If you seriously only want to find out what happened, again... A solicitor can do that because a solicitor, in pursuance of a claim, is entitled to all the documents, providing the patient gives permission, obviously, but in the pursuance of a claim on behalf of the patient is entitled to all the documents. They can get those documents examined by, indeed would in the normal process, get those documents examined by forensic medicos, if you like, forensic yeah. doctors who would go through it with a fine-tooth comb and would if you like, discover all the questions that need to be answered. Yeah. Now, it is possible that the outcome will be the decision not to give chemo at that time with the knowledge that was available at that time was a reasonable one. Yeah. Because the consequences of chemo, the, the, the discomfort, the, all the rest of it, are horrendous. The, the, the other points I would make there, when we found out that she should have had chemo, we also found out that she should have been brought back to the hospital for a 12-monthly checkup, and that well, has never happened. Well, OK, but what you're saying is you found out what should have happened. And with, it happened. With respect, you are aware what didn't happen, and you found out what often happens. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you've found yeah. out what should have happened. That's yeah. where you need a medical brain and a right. forensic medical brain looking at what did happen. And if you like, if, if in very simple terms, two and two makes four. If, yeah. if we look backwards and we say on the day that they gave the answer, the answer they gave three years ago was five when it should have been four. That's fine if today we know it was two and two. Yeah. But if at that time the question was, what is two and three, although yeah. the answer turns out not to be the right one in the end, it was yeah. the right one at the time. It's a yeah. very, very 
childish analogy, but mm. that's what they have to deal with, not with were the decisions the correct ones with the knowledge we have today, but yeah. were they the correct decisions with the knowledge they had then, and was there every effort taken to, to, to glean the knowledge, not to be more educated, but to glean the knowledge by examination of the patient and the like. So that's, that would be the way. Now, that is a, a quite long-winded process, yeah. and you realise what I'm referring to there. It's yeah. a quite long-winded process. It's not a happy process for the patient, for the claimant, very often. Not yeah. a happy process. Um, it will do one of two things. Either the hospital department will say, oh, God, they've got lawyers involved, we'd better get it dealt with, or they'll close all ranks. Yeah. And say, oh, God, uh, I mean, I mean, oh God they're doing us, tell them nothing unless we have to. I mean, to be, to be honest, things have progressed from there. She was discharged from hospital last week. Um, she's in a wheelchair. Mm. Um, we applied for continuing, wanted continuing nursing care for her. She's terminally ill. She's got pneumonia. She has difficulty breathing. Um, she's, in a, as I say, wheelchair bound. She can't get in and out of bed on her own. She needs two nurses and a mm. hoist. Yeah. Um, however, the social services decided that her mobility was fine and she didn't need continuing nursing care. She's gone into a nursing home with within a different PCT. Okay. And now, now you, uh, I mean, I'm sorry to cut you off in your prime, but that's okay. the, the question is, I now know what you want. It's irrelevant. I, I, that sounds harsh. It's yeah. a, what you want doesn't matter to fig. What does your mum want? She wants to be able to live the rest of her life with dignity. Well, would having her medical condition, her medical condition, mauled about, or the paperwork of it, mauled about, help her at all? Would it I help her with that objective? Does she, it's about what she wants, remember. Exactly, and it's something that she and I have discussed at length, and it isn't about what I want. This, she, mm. she wants some answers okay. as to what went then, wrong. Then I would suggest that you do a number of things, and it's it, one thing you could do, one thing you could do is speak first of all now time is of the essence uh, I, I'm not wishing your mum any um, permanent harm as it were but time is of the essence yeah, You've already... I'm well aware of that she was okay. in six months in March right then I would start first of all with your MP right because your MP may well I mean no I retract that I would do two things simultaneously I'd make right. an appointment with your MP now again the, they, that person may well be on holiday presently because yeah, we're in recess. recess. But make an appointment with your MP to discuss it with him or her. That's the first thing. Also, make an appointment with a medical negligence solicitor. There are a few that specialise in that around Manchester. The Law yeah. Society in Manchester will tell you which. Make What's an appointment the with them. Go along. You will probably get the first consultation for free, particularly yeah. if you ask for it, and say, look, I just want to discuss the case with you with a view to pursuing a medical negligence came, case. They'll see 50,000 quid before their eyes and think it's worth it's worth risking a £100 interview for now. It's isn't it? It's yeah. So, so <laughs> that's a very cynical view of the legal profession, but it's never <laughs> let me down yet. <laughs> so, so go and have a word. You can do it. You don't need at this stage your mum to do it. Go and have a word with the, the lawyers and see whether they think they can produce information for you or get yeah. information for you more quickly than any other way. Don't You can't instruct them to act. They can't act on your instruction. It would have to be your mum's. So, I, I've, I've got a, a letter from her authorising me to deal with, with this. Yeah, they... they, they the, I, I understand that, but the lawyer yeah. wouldn't take that letter unless it's... Um, unless you've got power of attorney, the lawyer would accept nothing less than talking to her directly before they start any action, and yeah. rightly so. Um, so, so they, but, but you could have a chat with them. They will discuss with you the prospects, not only of getting the information you seek, but of getting it within the time scale you look at. And good. that doesn't mean that they will automatically... Because lawyers, despite all I say sat here, lawyers are decent, honourable people in the end. Talk yep. to them about the prospects of the objectives that you say your mum wants. If they say, look, if all you want is information, we're not the people for you. Because as soon as we open our traps, the whole thing will close down. 
and yeah. it'll just make it more difficult, then then you know what that means. Yeah. Also, if if they do say that, then you've got your appointment with your MP, go and talk to your MP, because your MP can often wheedle information out. Yeah. But hospitals are very, very afraid understandably so, of answering questions... In particularly with the claim society of today. Well, yeah, exactly, because they say, well, I mean, I, I tell you what happens, I, I frequently quote this, but it's not universally the case, but in, in New Zealand there's a no-blame culture in medical negligence, so the hospital will say, yeah, we got it wrong, we're very, very sorry, we got it wrong, now let's sit down and talk about how much money it takes to get you as close to where you were as you were. Yeah. yeah instead of, oh, my God, they've made a terrible error, because we have a, we have a blame system. Somebody's yeah. got to be blamed. And if there's no one to blame, there's no money to be had. But, but yeah. the lawyer may be able, may be able to wheedle the information on the grounds of I'm entitled to the information as a representative of Mrs Nigel because we're bringing an action. Now, yeah. how quickly he can demand that, I don't know. The MP might be more successful. Right, I'll give the, those two avenues a try. All right, good luck with it. Thanks very much for your help, Alan. My pleasure. Have a good day. Bye. 0161 228 uh, And uh, uh, an emailer says, Your caller regarding medical negligence will need much perseverance and much money. He'll have to pay up front to independent medical experts to examine all the relevant documents. They charge thousands. It's actually hundreds, but no matter. That's just the start and does not include the legal fees to the lawyers. Finally, the medical profession will all close ranks and throw in as many obstacles and hurdles as they can. You're probably right, Brian, but it, it is better than it was. But it still ain't good. But if all else fails, it's doctors involved. All you've got to do is nick their car. Um... <laughs> Little current affairs gag to see you through. Hi, Alan. I have a gripe with the don't mention England in sport brigade. I mean, God forbid you fly the flag of St George in case you upset someone's great-great-great-granddaughter from the colonies for fear of provoking racism. In cycling's the Tour of Britain road race, the Welsh have a team, as do the Scottish. Why then does England not? There is Team GB. Is that not racist in itself? Yet more evidence of my country's identity being eroded. That's Andy in Bolton. In the Tour of Britain road race, the Scottish have a team, the Welsh have a team. Why don't the English... Is there not an English road race team? But, well, I don't understand. Because if, if the people representing... The UK. I don't understand. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't realise the the. I'm intrigued now by the Tour of Britain road race. The Welsh have a team. The Scottish have a team, but England doesn't. So is there a British team? Is that what you're telling me? You, you've told me what there isn't. I, I could do with knowing what there is. And then there's Team GB. Is that not racist in itself? Um. <laughs> I don't know. Is it racist? It's certainly... It's not defining a race, is it, really? It's defining the people who reside on a particular bit of island or a particular island. So, I, well, racist, I'm not sure. I think on the subject of what's what within the British Isles, you would be best to look back at Admiralty Law. Well, perhaps I would, but I may not bother. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not getting involved in that, dear God. The policy exchange report that is encouraging people to migrate south, this is from Ian in Stockport, seems to infer that the people have to cram into London to earn a good wage. What is the rest of the country for? With email, websites and phones, why do we all have to work in over-large cities that suffer from congestion? It seems there are two preferences for business, either work in London or the Far East. Again, what is the rest of the UK for? Well, I think the rest of the UK is there to make sure that there's enough stuff for the people in London to do. But the reason people earn more in London, and you've only got to have a conversation with somebody... I, I do it all the time, because people in this industry move up and down to London all the time. We've got thousands of the beggars coming up when we 
moved to Salford, haven't we, at the BBC? But people do. They go around to London to do a job for six months or what have you. And the conversation always is, how are you going to afford it? Now, it's fine if you go down there. If you move to London to work for six months for a large organisation like the government, the BBC, or what have you, they will, of course pay your expenses just like if when we went when they sent me <laughs> under caution when they sent me to las vegas they paid every penny it cost me every except you know things like having a go at blackjack and all that but fortunately i won anyway but they pay everything it costs me food and all of that yes they do of course they do it's the same if you go to London for a large organisation. They will pay your expenses if it's temporary. But once it becomes your job, once you're there for good, that's your job. All those extra bits that compensate you for the, the change, they go. And then it's hard work. Very hard work. 0161 228 2255. Further to your programme today, this is Ian in Whitefield throwing a spanner. Uh, Further to your programme today, Manx citizens do not have EU passports. They have British passports, which are in black covers and are identical to the ones that used to be issued in Great Britain and Northern Ireland before we had EU passports. I didn't know that. Manx people do not have EU passports because the Isle of Man is not part of the EU and their passports are issued in Douglas by the Manx government, not the UK Passport Agency. The Isle of Man is a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. Their argument was the birch was not cruel and unusual punishment, but a reasonable and proportionate one. The UK government has a similar line of argument in refusing to introduce, introduce legislation to outlaw smacking of children. Tell that to the bloke from Salford. The UK Home Secretary is responsible for the good government of the Isle of Man. The Manx government were persuaded by the UK that their argument that the birch was a reasonable and proportionate punishment was unsustainable and could not succeed. And it was the Manx government who chose to abandon it and then legislated to abolish the birch. Well, the last bit I knew, I knew that it was a, a government decision in the Isle of Man and was not an, an, an imposition as it were, and I knew also that they resisted it, saying that it wasn't in breach of the Convention of Human Rights. And if I understand correctly, and I'm prepared to be corrected again by you, Ian, and grateful to be, um, the Isle of Man was a later signatory to the Convention of Human Rights than was the UK, but again, I could be wrong. I am, I am misinformed, if what you tell me is correct. I'm misinformed that they still carry um, what we might call the British passport, utterly misinformed. I must speak to my Isle of Man relatives immediately. I, but I, I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. It was almost interesting. I say almost. Yeah. It's uh, 19 minutes to two. The news headlines with Michelle Adamson. Police have described a thief who stole a doctor's car as she helped a man who'd been in a road accident in Salford as despicable. Figures out today show the number of new cases of HIV in the northwest have fallen by 10% on last year. But the number of people living with the disease in the region is at its highest figure ever, with more people getting treatment. More young people have passed their A-level exams than ever, ever before. The pass rate topped 97% in England, Wales and Northern Ireland with record results in the highest grades as well. And Manchester's weather cloudy with some showers this afternoon, highs of 18 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Well, if you're using the motorways at the moment, uh, especially the M6, then watch out for delays on the northbound stretch of the carriageway between 15 Stoke-on-Trent and a junction 16 at Crewe. Uh, you'll notice two lanes are closed there, the middle and outside lanes, after a vehicle overturned at around about half past 11 this morning. And if you're using the M6 southbound again, one lane closed off owing to the same accident between junction 16 and junction 15, with uh, traffic backing up on the local A roads and on the main carriageway to Junction 17 at Sandbach. Uh, aside from that, though, generally, other routes seem to be moving fairly freely around the area. The M60 ring road not doing too badly. Traffic on the M61 coming down from Chorley to the Swinton Interchange. Southbound traffic again moving fairly well. And no major problems to report on public transport. But don't forget, if you can update me, maybe you're stuck in a queue that I've not mentioned. Call in on 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports with Will Perry. 
Good afternoon. Let's go live to Old Trafford. Lancashire are taking on Yorkshire in the county championship. Lanks made just 231 in their first innings, and they'll be looking for a bit more success with the ball. How are we looking at lunch, Chris Maliband? Yorkshire are 59 for one, Will, after 20 overs in their reply, with Andrew Gale on 22 and Anthony McGrath on 32. Lancashire struck early in the second over, and guess who? Yes, Dominic Court trapping Chris Taylor, LBW for two, with Taylor playing across the line. At four for one, Lancashire had the tails up, but since then, this partnership of 55 has rather stopped too much Lancastrian joy. Earlier in the day, Stephen Croft and Gary Keady took their partnership to 66 for the ninth wicket until Croft held out off Rashid for 68. Saj Mahmood followed shortly after for no score as Lancashire were bowled out for 231, claiming just one batting bonus point. Adil Rashid taking five for 95. Lancashire in need of early wickets after lunch. Yorkshire at the break, 59 for one. More from Chris online at bbc.co.uk slash Manchester, where you can hear ball by ball commentary. We'll be back there live throughout the afternoon. Well, here's the thoughts of Lancashire captain Stuart Law on the so dubbed batting crisis at Old Trafford. He thinks a different approach is necessary. I keep going back to, you know, in my mind, thinking about what, what was said to me at times when I first started playing cricket. And at times, you know, from guys like Alan Border, it made you cry. Maybe it's time for harsh words, I don't know. Um, cricketers these days aren't probably as, you know, attuned to that sort of behaviour, uh, that sort of dressing down. But being nicey-nicey isn't working. Cricket's 2020 Champions League has been put back to December. That's because it's clashed with the Champions Trophy. Well, Santa's not coming to town just yet. Manchester City have failed with their first attempt to bring Blackburn striker Roque Santa Cruz to Eastlands. Rovers have rejected City's offer. Joanne Smith's got more. Blackburn received a bid late last night and immediately turned it down. They've again said the Paraguayan International's not for sale and are disappointed with City's continued interest. But this offers good news for the club's fans. Some thought that Mark Hughes Hughes wouldn't have any money to spend this summer. Meanwhile, the Blues are in UEFA Cup action this evening. They face FC Midgieland of Denmark at the City of Manchester Stadium for the second round qualifier. Valerie Bodjanov is set to start up front for City, much to the delight of manager Mark Hughes. He's like a new signing, obviously, because uh, he had very little football for Man City prior to the injury. But uh, he's back. He's looking strong. Uh, he needs more work, obviously, because of the, the time that he was out. But... Um, he has the potential to be a real match winner for us this year. Well, Hughes has also told BBC Radio Manchester that veteran Chorluka and Stephen Ireland are staying put. Chorluka, of course, almost signed for Spurs last week. We'll have full match commentary of City's UEFA Cup tie in Manchester Sports from 7 o'clock this evening. Kickoff is at a quarter to 8. Meanwhile, City have been drawn away against Brighton in the second round of the Carling Cup. Macclesfield will play West Ham at Upton Park, while Oldham go to Burnley. And there are home ties for Bolton, who face Northampton, and Wigan, who play Notts County. The Latics have today let Marlon King move to Hull on a season-long loan. FIFA's president Seb Blatter says the Premier League wants to play some League Cup ties abroad after plans to stage the so-called uh, 39th league game overseas were withdrawn following heavy criticism. But the Premier League say a number of options are being considered. In Rugby League, Salford have signed their third player in as many weeks. Back row forward Luke Swain's joined from Australia. Jack and Phil are here with all the day's Rugby League news from 7 this evening. Lee Centurion's chief executive Alan Rowley will be live. In Beijing, Mark Foster's Olympic career came to a disappointing end when he failed to make the semi-finals of the 50 metres freestyle. Rebecca Adlington has beaten the Olympic record in qualifying for the final of the women's 800 metre freestyle. Uh, and British light heavyweight Tom Jeffries is through to the last eight in the boxing, but Billy Joe Saunders is out losing in the second round. And Gail Ems and Nathan Robertson have just begun their quarter-final badminton mixed doubles. They meet South Korea. This is the Northwest's biggest sports station. BBC Radio Manchester. Manchester City. Having been there to witness City's first game of the UEFA Cup in the far flung Faroes, the new season starts in the Faroe Islands. And in Barnsley for the second leg. Vassell can make it two on the night. He goes around the goalkeeper wide position and he scores. We'll be at Eastlands tonight as Mark Hughes' team take on SC Mijeland of Denmark. Everybody knows exactly where we expect to go this season and everybody's working. To that end. Our coverage starts at 7 with commentary from 7.45. We want to get through to the next round. We want to put this tie to bed. The all-new Manchester Sports, live tonight from 7. BBC Radio Manchester. Now, I have an email that says, Alan, have you followed up with your promise to put your, publish a picture of your salt mine visit on your website? Well, because I try to be reasonably honest... The answer, well, first of all, is no. But 
I won't hide behind the technology and say that I had tried to, but we'd had a technical problem, and we'll try to resolve it in the next 24 hours. I, I could have done entirely that and said that it wasn't my fault there was a technical hitch, but I won't. It wasn't my fault, because the producer forgot to remind me. Lunchtimes belong to Beswick. Alan Beswick. BBC Radio Manchester. The producer has left the building. <laughs> I forgot, I'm sorry. I completely forgot. So there you are. So, um, I've undertaken to... <laughs> I'll try and do it first thing when I come in tomorrow. Well, well, I'll try and, I'll try and get it here for tomorrow. Yeah, no, I've not remembered to take my tablets. <laughs> <laughs> Production help from Mr Richard Fair is nil. 0161 228 2255. If you want to join us, feel free. Andy in Bolton says, Alan, you read the text correctly. The Tour of Britain, this is the cycling tour I mentioned earlier, the Tour of Britain has Welsh and Scottish teams, as well as European pro teams and UK amateur teams. Also, the British cycling team, but no European team. Thanks for the response, Andy and Bolton. Uh, sorry, no England. Where, where did European come from? Thank you. No England team. Thanks for the response, Andy and Bolton. I don't understand. I really don't. And neither do you, Andy, and that's fair enough. But, but the people who are in the British cycling team, none of them from Wales or Scotland. It's just utterly confusing. I'm going to talk to Colin in Worsley in a minute, but I thought I'd share this with you. On this day... In 1979, I like this immensely. On this day in 1979, over the coast of Gwynedd, well, actually from the coast of Gwynedd to Clwyd in North Wales, the longest lasting rainbow on record shone. Isn't that amazing? Three hours. Yeah. Long, I mean, presumably you had to stand still to get the full three hours because rainbows move about, don't they? Don't, that's why you can never find a pot of gold. But isn't that wonderful? Colin in Worsley, are you? Hi, Alan. What have um, you got? Yeah, my, uh, um, it's about medical negligence. Oh, yeah. I think you frightened one or two people off when you said it's going to cost them thousands of pounds, maybe, to pursue. Well, I, I, I merely read an email that said that, but go on. Right, yeah, well, at this moment in time, I'm, up to, I'm pursuing a medical negligence case and to begin with I went to a top solicitors in Manchester and like you said they wanted like four and a half thousand pound just to basically investigate the case and maybe get a consultant to diagnose whether they had a case to answer mm. so obviously if the, the consultant said no I'd lost four and a half thousand pounds well yep. another good friend of mine then put me in touch with another medical solicitors and I've been to see them I had my free consultation with them and they agreed to take the case on board and actually I pay absolutely nothing. They go right the way through and towards the end of the case is there, if there is if it's a fifty fifty chance of something going wrong, you take an insurance policy out mm -hmm. just to cover. But obviously if they think it's a hundred percent case, you still take the insurance cover out, but that's paid by the other side when you win the case. Um, yes, it is. I, I'm not sure that the premium is, but if it is, I'm, I'm, pre I'm happy to have that knowledge. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right in that some firms will look at it at the first interview and say, we don't want it. Yeah. And so they will say, look, we don't want to pursue this case because we don't think it's strong enough for whatever reason. And if you, if you say, well, we'd like you to go ahead, you'll have to pay for it oh, yourself. That's obvious. Yeah, I appreciate now, that. Much, yeah. Yeah. Now, other firms, other firms will say, right, well, we'll give this a run and we will risk our own costs right. in giving it a run. Now, usually, usually people will take it because they can very nearly always, very nearly always, good Lord, but they can almost always get protection from that insurance policy that's you right. referred to. And what that's actually protecting is not the, the solicitor's cost that's acting for you, not the other side. It's the other side's costs, That's which, of right. course, can run into thousands, indeed, in a That's serious right. medical negligence case, can run into tens of thousands. So That's it's a right. protection against that in the event that your case fails. Yes, that's right. Yes. So that's what the insurance is. The insurance, incidentally, is not readily available because if it is unlikely that you will win... That's right. There's nobody, you know, at the risk of sounding really horrible to blind people, there aren't many blind people who will get car insurance. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because the insurers think he's probably going to crash into the car in front. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, so, right. so if your case is unlikely to fail or doesn't have a good enough chance, the insurance company will say, no, we're not doing that. And often, again, with solicitors, they will risk their own costs. In other words, we won't charge you a penny, That's right. but you will have to meet the disbursements. The yeah, disbursements well. are the money they pay out on your behalf too, um, to, to the consultants that will need to be engaged. So it's not, it's not a straightforward process, and, I, and I'm glad you make that point for right. us. Well, well, I can assure you the solicitors I'm using at this moment in time, all their disbursements for getting cult, um, consultants or anything, it's all covered by them totally. And it's written down in an agreement that they're all their out-of-pocket expenses is they give free a charge to you. And the only, uh, like I say, the only other side is if you decide to go to court, you know, they obviously the insurance company who are going to offer you this insurance um, policy. Actually, um, if our solicitors think there isn't a case to win the case, they won't take the insurance um, cover out and they'll just cancel the case before it actually gets into court anyway. So at the end of the day, when you get to right to the, to the point of going to court, whether it's a yes or a no on whether you're going to win the case, is then what a decision you make, whether you think oh, we're well, not going to win the case, or we don't want you to, otherwise you're going to have to pay out thousands. They do actually give you that term. Um, yeah, account. oh, I'm good. They also said to me, obviously, if you don't like the way we're handling the case, or, you know, uh, we don't want to handle it for you, go to another solicitor. Mm. They don't charge you anything. You know, they my solicitors won't charge me anything for their cost, apart from if another solicitor takes it on board, they'll just want the investigation fees, what they've been doing up to that moment in time. All right, mate. Well, how's your case progressing? We, we don't uh, well, want to know it, your condition. It, it, but... it, it's very early days. I'm suffering. I'm, I've took a drug that's made me go blind. So, Good and there's a, there's a drug out there. And it, I'd it, have picked a different description about the, about well, the motor the, insurance. I'm allowed to tell you the name of the drug. Um, it's probably at this stage not because oh, you're right. making allegations against. Yeah, but yeah, I'm it. only just saying it could be the, the the side effects. If the doctor was to tell you the side effects of the drug before you put put you on it, you'd never go on the drug. What happened to me? Somebody's put me on a drug without mm. actually proper consultation of the side effects. All In right. America, it's absolutely um, massive. The actual drug people, the law firms out there, are saying if you've been put on this. Drug, All right. Well, well, we're, we're, we're working towards indirectly identifying it. Yeah, there, well, so yeah, we'll, that's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on. No, obviously, yeah. Good it's on you, mate. There's something out there, mm. and people are unaware of it. It's a. It's, well, I, uh, sadly, yeah. um, sad, sadly, that is often the yeah. case with drugs. But Colin, yeah, good know. on you, mate. Thank yeah. you very much. Good luck with your case. Right, Cheers. No problem, Alan. Thanks very much. Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. There's still a bit of time if you want to use it that way. Um, Chris in Middleton says, Alan, are you sure that the BBC has not got an axe to grind on the congestion charge? What about the proposed extension of the metro to Media City? The BBC's coverage comes across to me as pro-congestion charge, but then I don't want to be a serf who is charged for going to work either by motor car or the inflated bus and rail fares they'll no doubt be keeping under their hat until after the vote. A monthly bus ticket costs £40 now and you can't even get to south of Manchester using it without getting on another operator's bus where you'll be charged again. Well, I'm not a spokesperson for the BBC, but I know as well as I can know anything about the organisation I work with, there is no agenda other than to inform. And the BBC would come down on me a, like a tonne of bricks if I actually said their agenda was to get people to vote. They don't even get involved in that. The BBC is very, very, very strict about such matters. The agenda we have, there is always an agenda. The agenda we have is to give the people of Greater Manchester the information they need to make two decisions. One, whether they will vote or not, and two, which way they'll vote, but not to influence either of those two entirely separate decisions. Do I vote? If I do, which way do I vote? I don't actually care which way you vote. I, slightly outside of BBC policy, <laughs> I would... I would <laughs> I would wish you to vote, I would, but then I would always wish you to vote because I'm very, very keen on the democratic system and the democratic system is weakened by all sorts of things. One of those things is by people not voting. And if you're looking for someone to blame for that, 
then the blame falls squarely at the feet of me dad and me mum, who, if ever I didn't vote... Well, my mum's gone now, but if ever I did... What am I saying my mum's gone for? My mum's dead. But if ever, if ever I didn't vote and told me dad I didn't vote, he would... He wouldn't say anything, but he'd be disappointed. He would. Because we believe, he believes, I believe, in the democratic system. And the democratic system relies entirely on people voting. And the final story about the Isle of Man that I said I would touch upon, my wife's niece lives in the Isle of Man and is at university in Britain. <laughs> there you are, you see. It's in the, at university on the mainland. The Isle of Man government pay her fees, so she's not going to go into um, adult employment, if you will, with £20,000 worth of debt. But the interesting thing was that when she and three others decided to get a flat together, the landlord, quite rightly, wanted a guarantor for the rent. And so she gave her parents and said, they were. She said, well, I don't want them. I don't want them. I'm not having them. They don't live here. They're foreigners. They're on the Isle of Man. So guess which poor schmuck ended up as the guarantor? Now, all right, they you know, their parents, if all went pear-shaped, their parents would cough. But nonetheless, there. Yeah. No, we don't want them. They're not from here. Right, I'm back tomorrow. I'm not sure what country I'll be in. I'm not even sure what country I'm in now. All I've got is a countryfied headache. But that is life. I will be back. And I hope to have that photograph on the internet, but there are no guarantees. Diane Luke's next. See you tomorrow. ta -da now. <laughs> Scratching cars or cutting up suits? What's the worst act of revenge you've ever performed? Find